Hello friends and welcome again. My name is Pastor James Rafferty and we're so glad you've joined us for this lesson number 10 of the second quarter of 2024. We are studying spiritualism exposed. It's going to be a jam-packed lesson, so we want to get right to the lesson. But before we do that, I want to remind you that if you'd like to get the lesson notes from each one of our panelists, you can do that by emailing us at ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org. Now let me introduce the panel, your family and mine, to my immediate left, Professor Daniel Perrin. It's good to be here. I am dealing with Monday's lesson, Death in the Old Testament. Amen. And to your left, Pastor John Denzi. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I have Tuesday death in the New Testament. All right. And to your immediate left, my dear sister, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Pastor James. On Wednesday, we look at spiritualism in the last days, part one. Part one. So to your left must be Pastor John Lomacain. Spiritualism in the last days, part two. two. Whatever she leaves over, I'll have next. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we get started, we want to have a word of prayer. Sister Jill, would you like to pray for us? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we're so grateful that you are our God who can show us deceptions, and you can impart wisdom to us through the study of your word. And we ask right now that you would open up our minds and hearts as we study that Satan's deceptions would be fully unmasked. And we thank mm -hmm. you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, we just want to encourage you as our brothers and sisters in Christ to grab a Bible, even grab something you can take notes with. This is going to be jam-packed. We're going to be learning a lot about Satan's deception in the last day, spiritualism exposed. Our lesson study for this week covers Matthew 10, 28, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, Isaiah 8, 19, and 20. John 11, 11 through 14, as well as verses 21 to 25, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, Revelation 16, 13 and 14, Matthew 24, 23 to 27, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. I told you we were going to be covering a lot of ground in this lesson. We want to remember that from Genesis and our creation all the way through to the time in which we live and even to the coming of Jesus Christ, the devil's most successful deception against us is spiritualism. The idea that you shall not surely die. It lays at the very foundation of his battle plan all the way through to Armageddon, the final showdown between God and the devil in which every one of us who are alive at that time are going to be involved. So from Genesis to Revelation, this idea of spiritualism, this idea of you won't surely die if you disobey God. In contrast, what the Bible says, the soul that sins, it shall die. That's why to this day, people get a little nervous when they uh, are faced with the idea of going to a graveyard, especially if they're going there during a full moon. They know those people are dead, but they're not sure if they're surely dead, mm. right? We have this idea that there are spirits of the dead, maybe floating around, maybe trying to communicate to us that houses may be haunted. We even celebrate Halloween like we've nev never celebrated it before since I was a young man in this country with, with marketing and mm. promoting communicating with departed spirits, with skeletons and ghosts and witches and etc., exactly contrary to the written word of God. The quarterly says in uh, Sunday's lesson, the Lord forbade his people from involvement in the occult, in occultism of any kind. They were not to tolerate among them a medium or a spiritualist or one who calls up the dead. And that's based in Deuteronomy 18 verse 11. Such people were to be stoned to death, Leviticus 20, verse uh, 27. The punishment seems incredibly harsh, but it was designed to protect Israel from worshiping false gods. The first and the greatest deception that was ever foistered upon the human race was this idea that we could communicate with the dead, that the dead don't surely die. And that goes all the way back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3. So witchcraft, the quarterly goes on to say, is demonic. It seduces people into false worship and counterfeits a genuine relationship with God. It can never satisfy the deepest longings of the heart. Spiritualism is at the heart of Satan's plan to take the world captive. But Jesus says, by his grace and by his power, he can set the captives free from the chains of evil that bind them. 
So we see example number one of spiritualism that I'd like us to look at here in 1 Samuel chapter 28. You know, Saul has turned away from God. He's disobeyed God and God has replaced him. And Saul in this deceived mindset is seeking to find out about his future. He's seeking communication and he specifically wants to seek communication from the, from the departed person of Samuel, the prophet who is now dead. And so Saul does something that he wasn't supposed to do that he himself forbade in his kingdom because the word of God told him, of course, as we just read, Saul seeks a familiar spirit, someone who is a medium, someone who can communicate with the dead. Uh, in 1 Samuel 28, they're called a familiar spirit. And it's interesting that phrase there because we know that a spirit is another word sometimes for people we say of person, persons that they have a good spirit or they're a good spirited person. And a familiar spirit would be someone that we're familiar with. Sam, uh, Saul was familiar with Samuel. Saul wanted to communicate with Samuel. And many times when the devil tries to deceive us, he does it through people we're familiar with, through family members, through friends, through people we've connected with in life. People that we would recognize, their voice, their mannerisms, their appearance, and he can can personate those people, come to us and deceive us. Don't for a second uh, be deceived by the idea that there is no power in spiritualism, that spiritualism is a fraud and it's a fake. There is plenty of power behind spiritualism. The devil himself is behind spiritualism. And that's what we see in 1 Samuel chapter 28. A lot of people as we do evangelism and share and teach and preach, a lot of people will bring the story of Saul and the witch of Endor to my attention and say, hey, you know, pastor, you know, in the Bible it says that Saul went to uh, a witch and, and the witch showed him uh, uh, Samuel and, and Samuel communicated with Saul. And you're saying that we shouldn't do this, but the Bible says that Saul did this and it, and it seems really real. That's the point. That's the point. Deception is so great that we can look at a story that God is showing clearly to warn us against it and we can use that to try to promote or support the idea that we can communicate with the dead. It's a deception that's so great that it's easy for us to fall into it. There's a few Bible verses that this uh, study, this today's study wants us to look at. The first one is found in, in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5. Let's look at that verse. It's a very familiar verse to many of us, but not all of us may be familiar with it. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now, this truth and this verse really helped me. I was raised in a Christian uh, ch uh, church, a Christian community. I was raised believing in God, but I didn't understand the state of the dead. And I was, as a young man, I was told, my mom told me that she had seen a ghost once and I was always a little fearful. You know, I was always a little nervous about the whole idea. And when I came to the Bible and saw what the Bible said, that the Bible forbade us communicating with the dead, that it was actually the devil who told us that when we die, we don't surely die. And the devil is the one that seeks to get us to communicate with him through these familiar spirits and personating these familiar the spirits, it brought such peace to my mind and to my heart to recognize that the deceased were resting in the grave and there was no torment in hell where they were being tormented and burned or, or a place in heaven where they were looking down on all of our, our sorrows and our cares and our perplexities, but that God had laid them to rest until that resurrection for the just, the first resurrection, and for the unjust, the second resurrection. It brought great peace to my mind. And I read verse after verse after verse, like for example, Job chapter 7, 9 through 10, as the cloud is consumed and vanishes away, so he that goes down to the grave shall come up no more. Oh, that was good news. He shall return no more to his house, no more haunted houses. Oh, that was good news. Neither shall his place know him anymore. So there's not going to be this knocking and this creaking and these things going through the house and oh, that must be uncle so-and-so, that must be aunt so-and-so. No, none of that, according to the Bible, is actually true. And then, of course, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19 says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek to them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and mutter, should not a people seek unto the Lord their God for the living to the dead? We need to go to the Word of God, and we need to let the Word of God tell us about the living and the dead. And the Word of God does tell us about the living and the dead. Very clearly communicates this to us. The Word of God also tells us uh, about some of the specifics of the showdown that we're going to be encountering in the last days. Revelation chapter 16. Now, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, the, all of these verses as we continue to study, but I want to just pick up on two of the verses, verses 16 and 17 of Revelation chapter 16. Sorry, Revelation chapter 16, uh, verses... 
15 and 16, Revelation 16 verses 15 and 16, because they weren't in our lesson study and I think there's an important point here that God is bringing to us. In Revelation chapter 16, beginning with verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest they walk naked and they see his shame. Then verse 16, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And this is the only place in the Bible that the word Armageddon is used. The battle of Armageddon has to be understood in the context of what the Bible teaches about it. And the Bible teaches that it's a gathering. In fact, that word gather there actually means to entertain. At least in verse 16, it means to entertain. And here's what the showdown looks like, practically speaking. The devil is seeking to entertain us out of the kingdom of God. The devil is working through media and entertainment to entertain spiritualism into our lives and into our heart. That's why everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, you're going to see spiritualism in our sports programs, in our music, in our entertainment, in our movies. It's all over the place. The Bible says it's going to be like frogs. The frogs of Egypt were everywhere. They were in the bedchambers. Yep, you've got your TV in your bedchamber and you're watching that TV and sure enough, spiritualism is coming in. There's nowhere that it isn't. In contrast to this, we're told to hold on to the garments of Christ's righteousness. How do we hold on to the garments of Christ's righteousness? Well, we're told in two places. The first one is in Malachi chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. I'm just going to give you the references that those who feared the Lord talked often one to another and thought upon His name, and they're written in the book of life. So you've got this contrast between those who are watching TV and being entertained with media and actually being gathered or entertained into spiritualism and those who are focusing on Christ and thinking upon Christ's name. In Revelation chapter 14, it says that they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now another insight to this I think is pretty powerful. It's, a, it's support from a statement in the lesser light, the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Ellen White, that helps us to understand this greater light. It says this, Education 189. A large share of the periodicals and books that, like the frauds, frogs of Egypt, are overspreading the land are not merely commonplace, idle, and innovating, but unclean and degrading. Remember the unclean spirits? Their effect is not merely to intoxicate and ruin the mind, but to corrupt and destroy the soul. So, of course, periodicals and books today come in a far more persuasive form of media. But you're getting the point. The point that's being made here in this statement is that God is clearly applying the frogs of Egypt to unclean and degrading media, overspreading our land, destroying souls. It is the very essence of the battle of Armageddon and spiritualism is at its core. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor Raverty. That is good. Spiritualism is everywhere and you have to be careful, especially if you got kids, what is coming into their minds. I am Daniel Perrin and I have Monday's lesson, Death in the Older Testament. I say that because I want to emphasize that the Testaments are united. They're going to say the same thing. It's easy to look back as a revisionist and to try to create confusion where there was perfect clarity. There is no confusion among the writers of the Old Testament and the people who read those books at that time. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke the truth, clearly. But let's imagine, let's just imagine what would the Older Testament be like if there was an immortal soul? What would the Holy Spirit have inspired them to write if that were true? Genesis 2:17, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. At that point, Adam then would inform God that he was wrong about man's mortality. And God would realize his error and correct the record for the future. Is that what we find? No. Still imagining though, let's say that they believed in an immortal soul, these men inspired by the Holy Spirit, what would they have recorded in the scriptures? Well, we would find prayers to the dead, any of those in there? Not a single one. Prayers for the dead to have a good existence in the afterlife. I don't find those in my Old Testament. We would find instructions to God's people to build great monuments for the afterlife of those people who had passed on. We find those in Egypt and other cultures, but not among God's people. We would find some kind of belief in second chances after you're dead. Instead, you find this, Ecclesiastes 9.10, and this is just sampling examples. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work 
or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Pretty clear there. Imagining if they believed in an immortal soul, we would find in the Old Testament some instructions about seances and communications with the dead. And, and here's how to reach those people who have passed on. Anything like that in your Bible? No, it's exactly the opposite. Leviticus 19.31 in the NIV says it this way, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. There's no gray area in that for me. Uh, we would find statements of joining your ancestors in a new realm. You're going to be with grandpa soon. Anything like that in the Bible? No, it says they rested with his ancestors. What is rest? No labor, no activity, completely inactive. Look up rested in a concordance and just go through and see if scripture is consistent on this. Who rested? David, Solomon, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Abijam, Asa, Basha, Omri, Ahab, Jehoshaphat, Joram, Jehu, and the list goes on and on. Never once does it say in the Old Testament that we read, he joined his ancestors in a realm above so that they could continue their activities up there. All right, that's not what happens. Let's go and look at some of these deaths. The first death in the Bible, when Cain killed Abel, Genesis chapter four, and I want you to listen carefully to what God does say and what he doesn't say. Genesis chapter four, verses 10 and 11, God speaking to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, he's not talking about Abel speaking, talking about his blood that's been spilled. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Well, what is the blood? It represents the life. In fact, it says so. The life is in the blood. We find that in scripture. And so his life now has been poured out and it's buried in the ground. And this simply reiterates to Cain what God had already spoken to his parents. Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 19 said, you will return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return. No statement here of Abel having gone on to some other realm. Now let's look at the second recorded death. There might have been other deaths, but the second recorded death, it's in Genesis 4. Six generations after Adam, and this is in the, the family line of Cain. Lamech has murdered somebody. It says, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. Any clues here? Well, he doesn't say to them, uh, I have killed his body. Or I wounded him better than he wounded me. I, I sent him off to the next realm. He says, I killed him. Even, even the, the unrighteous people here, they knew the truth. Mm. One more chapter, Genesis chapter five. We go through this, this chapter and eight times you're gonna find this phrase, and he died, mm -hmm. and he died, and he died. Eight times, only one exception. Enoch does not die because God takes him. Amen. And here's the point. The righteous who died are not the ones who are with God in heaven. Mm -hmm. Only Enoch is the one who was taken by God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now I could go through several examples, but I'm going I'm to hit on just one here. In Genesis 23, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, has died. Now God says that he knew Abraham has a friend. And in Genesis 18, 19, he says that he trusted that he would teach his family the truth after them. So if Abraham, who has been taught by God, if he believed that there was an immortal soul, wouldn't he have taught his children, his household, his family, his servants, the people he knew in Canaan about that? We just don't find any any reference to that? J Abraham does not give any assurance that Sarah's died, but she's gone on and she's going to watch over you. Instead, what does he do? He buys a field with an empty cave and he buries his wife. Now, we've seen this now in the books of Moses. Let's keep on going through the Older Testament here. Do we find this in other places? How about the book of Psalms? Is there anything in the book of Psalms? Go to Psalm 17, verse 15. And these, these are just samples. In my notes, I'll try to put a few more there that you can look at as well. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied. Now, now when are they satisfied? When I wake in your likeness. Let's do one more. Psalm 13, verse 3. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. All right, so here we have it once again. We've seen it through, through the books of Moses in the Psalms, what, that death is equated to a sleep. I will awaken, not now, later. How about the books of the prophets? 
Absolutely. Now we could go through a variety of texts here. I'll share just two. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Go ahead to Isaiah 26, verse 19. It says this, your dead shall live. It doesn't say they do live. They shall live together with my dead body. They shall, there's future tense again, shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. All right, so we got this consistent witness that there's a future time when the dead rise. One more in the prophets, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so this is not just a, a one-time experience here in Isaiah. We got it through other prophets as well. But how about the sanctuary? We are instructed in the sanctuary. Is there anything we can find in this unified system of truth that tells us what happens when people die? Leviticus 23, commanded to God's people six annual feast, annual celebrations throughout the year. Now the last feast is called the Feast of Tabernacles, also called in Exodus 23 and Exodus 34, called the Feast of Ingathering. So this was a joyful celebration and it was a commemoration looking back at their journey to the promised land where they had been dwelling in temporary tents until God gave them their permanent home there in Canaan. And so by that means it was also prophetic. It was looking forward to the true tent, the final tent, God's home in heaven that would come. And here's what I want you to notice. The ingathering, the feast of ingathering into heaven is not celebrated until a short while after the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement we know is the judgment. So after the judgment, then the reward is given, eternal life or eternal death, not before. We find this all through the story that God gives us. Now, if God was like Satan, what would he have said to Adam when Adam died? I can imagine it something like this if he was more like Satan, the adversary, the enemy. You come up here and you watch everything. You're going to have to watch the whole thing. And then you're going to watch me torture people forever. That's not what God says. Instead, he, he says something like this, or here's my interpretation through scripture. Trust me. You will rest and I will make it right and put an end to sin. Amen. Like he said to Daniel, mm -hmm. chapter 12, verse 13, you will rest and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Mm -hmm. Any reader of the Old Testament can see that Satan has been preparing for the final deception since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. God said, if you sin, you will surely die. Satan comes back with a lie. You're not going to die. God's word is plain and clear from the start, and it stands up to scrutiny the whole way through. Amen, amen. amen. Powerful, you know, this is so clear and it's so important, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back, friends. We're moving into Tuesday's lesson. Thank you, Pastor James. I am doing Tuesday. John Dinsey is my name, and the title is Death in the New Testament. Let's go right away to John chapter 11, 11 through 14. These things he said, and after he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So here we have uh, the story of when Lazarus died. And remember that Martha and Mary sent a message to Jesus. Him whom thou lovest is sick. 
their hope was that right away Jesus would come and lay his hands on him and he would be well. But Jesus delayed and did not come and Lazarus died. Now, the disciples knew that he was sick. So that's why they said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he's going to get well. They thought, as it says here, that he, he was talking about rest and sleep. But you see, the Bible is very consistent in the Old Testament. Those that died were said to be asleep in the grave. What are they doing there? Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> They're not doing anything. They're just a moment in the grave until the resurrection comes, whether the resurrection of the dead, of the righteous, or the resurrection of the wicked. Only two resurrections. Now, John chapter 11 continues with verse 21. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now notice that Martha knew that the resurrection would be at the last day. She knew that her brother Lazarus was not in heaven. We now go to John chapter 6. Now notice this because she said the resurrection will be at the last day. Where did she learn this from? In John chapter 6 verse 39, actually in John chapter 6, you, you see Jesus repeating the same thing four times. Not once, twice, not three times, four times. Let's go. John 6 Verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me that, all of all that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Jesus is talking about resurrection being at the last day. Verse 40, one more time. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Mm -hmm. Let's look at number three, John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. So Martha knew that Jesus was talking about him raising up at the last day because she had learned it from Jesus. But of course, we know that Jesus did a, an exception for Lazarus and raised him from the dead. Now, this is one of the few people, well, this is the only people, that, only person we know that would die twice. <laughs> Look at John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Where are they? In the grave, Jesus says. Now look at it. Look at what it says in verse 29. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. To resurrection. The resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of condemnation. And notice when those that are uh, asleep in Jesus, when they will come up. We are going to go, uh, we're going to see this in a moment. 2 Timothy verse one, chapter 1, verse 10. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Lord, of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. So Jesus Christ has brought immortality. Right now we are mortal. So the idea of an immortal soul does not exist in the Bible. You heard Pastor James say, the soul that sinneth shall die. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to find out when is the resurrection of the righteous pointed out again. Behold, I tell you a mystery, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. That means we're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. This is future. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is when Jesus Christ comes. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So when is this? At the last trump, at the last trumpet, when Jesus Christ returns. Beautiful. It is brought out in the scripture over and over again that the dead are asleep. Those that are righteous, those that have done good, are waiting for the resurrection of life. And those that are wicked, they're going to come up at the resurrection of damnation. And they are 1,000 years apart. You can see this in Revelation chapter 20. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 really quick. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, those that are alive are not going to go to heaven before those who are asleep in the grave. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Notice again the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Praise the Lord. What do you mean rise first? That means you're going to come up from the grave and go into the air. Notice verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord where? In the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So I'm reading from the lesson now. Look at these words of Paul. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 18. The lesson continues. How does one make any sense of these verses if the dead at death are already in the bliss of heaven? It doesn't make sense. So please understand that those that are asleep in Christ, that are in the grave, they're not doing anything. They're not playing trumpets. They're not playing harps. They are they have no participation in anything that is done. Uh, we, we've seen this over and over again. First Corinthians chapter 15, I'm beginning in verse 19. This is marvelous as well. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most miserable, it says in the King James Version. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Notice very carefully. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterwards, those who are Christ, when? At his coming. So it is a consistent teaching in the Bible that those that are dead, they're just dead. And the res resurrection uh, of the uh, righteous is when they will again be alive. Because God is the one that gives us that life. So I want to encourage you to continue. You know, this is good news because we understand many of us have loved ones that have passed away, uh, believing in Christ. Th these, this is good news to understand they are uh, waiting and we will see them again. Together we'll meet the Lord in the air. And this is a teaching that is very beautiful and true to understand and, and beautiful to understand that uh, the Lord has given that, us that blessed hope. And we encourage you to consider the truth of the scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament harmoniously presents this message that we have a resurrection coming. Those that are righteous, will be resurrected when Jesus Christ returns. Those that are wicked 1,000 years apart, they will be resurrected to face for the things they have done, to face uh, condemnation for the things they have done. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny and Daniel and Pastor James. What an incredible study, spiritualism exposed. Mm -hmm. It's such a critical topic and it's really life and death. I'm Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, we look at spiritualism in the last days, Part one, and I already told Pastor John, oh, yeah. I hope I'm not overstepping onto his day. So we're going to discover that. But if anybody can pull something out of nothing, it's Pastor John. So I know you're going to do an amazing job, even if I step over a little bit. So what is spiritualism? We've been talking about this this whole time. I want to give you a definition from Oxford Dictionary. 
Spiritualism is a system of belief or religious practice based on supposed communication with the spirits of the dead, especially through mediums. As Pastor James and Daniel brought out so very clearly, the history of spiritualism began all the way back in the Garden of Eden when the serpent said to Eve, you shall not surely die. And this concept of the immortality of the soul, that when the body dies somehow, the soul continues on in some other existence, that concept was born. We see in the ancient pagan practices as you continue through history, witchcraft, communicating with the spirits, sorcery, and magic. And those pagan practices continue all the way to today in some cultures or people groups. We see that the church broadly accepted this concept of the immortality of the soul. Remember the first few centuries AD after Christ. Remember the pagan practices began to creep into the church and there was compromise. And at that time, one of those practices that came into the church was this concept of immortality of the soul. So we see that even in the Christian church, people who claim the name of Jesus, spiritualism is flourishing. We see at the last days, we're going to find this rampant deception of spiritualism. And on my day, I want to focus specifically on the deceptive aspect of spiritualism. In Matthew 24, we look at, remember Jesus talking to his disciples about destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. And we see in Matthew 24, 5, he says, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will receive many. We see this deception take place at the end of time. There's also deception about false prophets who will rise up and deceive many. But the deception is not just for the people in the world, the people who don't know Jesus, even the very elect could be deceived. In other words, the deception's even going to come upon people who claim the name of Jesus. Christians in the church, we see in Matthew 24, 24. Mm -hmm. False Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. We see the second beast of Revelation chapter 13, I call it the land beast, the second beast that rises up out of the earth, it will perpetuate deception. We're in Revelation 13, verse 13. He, this is the second beast that rises up out of the earth. This is none other than apostate Protestantism. He performs great signs. These great signs are miracles that will establish his authority. He even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth. You see deception becoming rampant across the earth. I see a threefold union of deception the counterfeit trinity, take place in Revelation 16. So let's turn there. Revelation 16. Now this is the counterfeit, as it were, to the three angels' messages. In Revelation 14, we see the three angels' messages. And what are they doing? Gathering the remnant, proclaiming the everlasting gospel message. Here we see three unclean spirits like frogs who are demons, three demons, gathering the wicked, as it were, for that last great battle that Pastor James talked about in his day. Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now it's interesting, if you look at the 10 plagues in Egypt, what was the very last plague that the magicians could counterfeit? It was the plague of the frogs. This shows this is Satan's last attempt to counterfeit the work of God. And what are those three unclean spirits like frogs? Coming out of the mouth of the dragon. This is none other than modern day spiritualism with its roots in ancient paganism. Out of the mouth of the beast. This is none other than the first beast of Revelation chapter 13, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, 
none other than the second beast of Revelation chapter 13, apostate Protestantism. And what do they do? Verse 14, they're spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Mm -hmm. This is Armageddon that Pastor James already talked about that last battle. I want to read you a quote from Great Controversy, page 588. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deception. While the former, that's the immortality of the soul, we've mm -hmm. been talking about this lesson, lays the foundation of spiritualism. The latter, that is Sunday sacredness, creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States, this is the false prophet from that Revelation 16 verse, will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country, that's the United States of America, will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So let's focus the rest of the lesson on this deceptive nature of spiritualism. Now, this is Jill's thesis. I believe deception is effective because we trust our emotion instead of the authority of the Word of God. We say, it looks like Grandma, so it must be her, even though she's already dead. If it looks like Christ and sounds like Christ and talks like Christ, it must be Christ. How could that person be healed except by divine power? It's going all the way back to the Garden of Eden and Eve, and she saw that the tree was good for food. It's being deceived by our senses. It's trusting emotion over the authority of the Word of God. So three takeaways, Pastor John. How can we not be deceived in these last days? Number one, test every experience by the Word of God. Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Takeaway number one, trust the word of God above the deception of spiritualism. Now, it's interesting because that verse in Isaiah 8 is actually talking, if you read the context, it's in the context of spiritualism, mediums and wizards. It's in that context. Number two, Emotions and experiences are not always reality. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. Who can know it? Takeaway number two. Trust the word of God over your instincts or over your gut as we were to say. Now, that's not to say that the Lord, the Holy Spirit doesn't impress people. I'm not saying that. But I am saying if you come upon an experience, if something happens and you see that and you say, oh, this must be true because it feels good and it feels right, I'm going to trust my heart. No, trust the authority of the Word of God Amen. over your emotions or what feels right because emotions and experience Experiences are not always reality. Number three, walk in obedience to what the Word says. You know, in Matthew 7, there's this interesting, it's, it's a sad passage to me. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And have we not done many wonderful works in your name? Mm -hmm. And I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Takeaway number three, trust the word of God enough to walk in obedience. Mm -hmm. You can see we can feel saved. We can feel like we're following Jesus. We can feel like we're following him. But unless you and I are willing to walk in obedience, when you find a clear thus saith the Lord in the word of God, you and I might be deceived. That's right, thank you. All, all of you for laying the foundation and I have what's left, which is quite a bit. The Bible is a very deep book. You know, the joy that we look for is the consummation of our hope, the second coming of Jesus. And Satan's aim is to 
replicate or duplicate or somehow cause us to be deceived by replacing the actual visible literal second coming of Jesus with something called a secret, a secret rapture. And Paul talks in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Satan's goal is to destroy our hope in the coming of the Lord. He's also spreading his tentacles far and wide because as Jill pointed out, I want to bring something out in Revelation 13, the universality of his deception. Notice what it talks about in Revelation 16, verse 13. And it says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Notice three things pointed out that was involved in the first deception, the mouth, the mouth, the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, the mouth of the false prophets. It is what they're saying. So therefore, do not trust the word of man over the word of God. When men say, I know what God's word says, but, and you'll find that this replete in the Christian vernaculars today. So many say, I know the Sabbath is true, but that's satanic. The moment you hear, but after a truth in God's word is revealed, I know that the Sabbath is true, but my church, my pastor, my experience, my day of worship, that is the first attempt in elevating man above the word of God. And that is the first indication of spiritualism. Remember, there's only one devil, but many demons. And the demons are referred to as spirits of demons. Secondly, Jill touched on this. Don't trust your senses over scripture. And I believe that James talked about this and each one of our presenters talked about the importance of understanding them. When people are dead, they're dead. Nobody's coming back to bring you a message. Nobody's coming to a dinner at your house. Nobody's fiddling with your clock and changing times and putting their journey on your bed or spraying their cologne in the bathroom. That's the spirits of demons performing signs. And believe me, if you don't believe that spirits and demons and, and, and spirits that are evil are roaming the earth, you are a sitting duck for Satan's grand deception. So Jill, I have seven reasons why spiritualism is so prevalent today. First sign of spiritualism is scriptural misrepresentation. The very first thing, scriptural misrepresentation, misrepresenting God's word. Well, that's how the deception began. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning or subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And notice the first thing he said. He said to the woman, did God indeed say? I mean, did God really say that? I mean, I mean, does the Bible really say that? How many preachers say that today? I had a preacher tell me, tell me one day when I kept saying what the Bible says, he says, would you stop saying what the Bible says and just tell me what you say? And I say, what I say have no weight over the Bible. Thus saith the Lord is the only foundation of safety. Amen. The second evidence of spiritualism is subtle deception. Satan is never obvious. He doesn't say, Jill, I'm about to deceive you. He studies us and comes from an angle that we do not see. That's why our minds must be sharpened. Notice what he says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Ellen White says Satan's footsteps are noiseless. Mm -hmm. He said, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel is not complicated. It's when you try to find support for ever living, support for eternal burning, su support for people still living as, uh, as a professor Daniel Parent said, as Daniel said, when you try to support a lie, it's confusing because you can't find support. That is corrupting people from the simplicity of Christ. And Romans 16 verse 18 says, for those who do such things do not serve the Lord Christ, but their own bellies. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. When a person just begins to know what the Bible says, the devil sends reinforcements to let them say, well, I know what your teacher says, but that's not what the Bible says. They deceive the simple. So be careful. If you just start studying the Bible, stay in the Bible and don't take the word of man. If somebody says something, measure it by a plain, thus saith the Lord. The third evidence of spiritualism is spiritual camouflage. And this is one that's working today because he looks religious doesn't mean he is religious. 
2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 15, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder or no marvel for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Watch this. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, Satan has ministers, the Bible says he does, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Satan is in the camouflage business because they look the part, because they carry a Bible, because they preach, don't believe it. If it's out of harmony with God's word, he says they transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. But what's going to happen in the end? Whose end will be according to their works. The fourth indication of spiritualism is worship without truth. Worship without truth. People say, I need an experience. It feels good. Oh, I just love that music. The Lord never said it shall be. The Lord never challenged the devil by it is sung. He said it is written. Don't let music be the method by which you push aside God's word because music makes you feel good. That's what happened through Satan's gift that is remaining. Remember, he was the chief musician. Music he used today to deceive. But notice what the Bible says, worship without truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 to 12, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. Notice all power, signs and lying wonders. It looks like a miracle, but God has nothing to do with it. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. And how are they being deceived? Here's the key. Because they did not receive the love of the truth. When you don't love truth, the devil loves you that they might be saved. For this reason, God says, oh, you don't want manna, I'll send you quail. You don't want truth, I'll send you deception. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Why? That they all may, may be condemned, or as the King James Version says, they may be damned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Let me say something. There are some people that love false doctrines. They love lies from the pulpits of America because it doesn't require any life change. It requires them to design their own religion. And when they hear truth, you can always tell that there's a spirit working from the inside because they disdain truth and they find every reason to ignore it. Spiritualism, fifth reason why it's contentment in the place of commandments. Contentment in the place of commandments. Mark 7, 7. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When people say you can't eat fish, but you can ignore the Sabbath, that's teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When they said cover your head with a cloth, but don't follow us in God's word, you can always tell false religion when they have you do things instead of following a plain thus saith the Lord. There's a whole lot of them today that's dressing you into crazy garments, looking like somebody from the Middle East. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but they take you back to this archaic design of religion, making you think somehow you are now more religious than those that look normal. Indication number six, signs without sanctification. Signs without sanctification. Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Let me make it abundantly clear. The elect will not be deceived because they settle for nothing other than it is written. Can you say amen to that? And here's the last one. I don't know if I can get through it. Spiritualism is alliance, an alliance with darkness. You know, when God rejected Saul, he made a statement that sounds like a lot of ministers nowadays. He said, find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. When ministers make an alliance with those who are involved in spiritualism, it is a grand indication that as the Bible says in Revelation 18, that Babylon is the cage of every, every foul spirit and unclean and hated bird. Saul consulted a witch. And here's the danger. He said to her in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 9, then he said to the woman, look, you know what Saul has said. She said, the woman said, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums. And listen to what he said in verse 10. And Saul swore to her by the Lord, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you. The last indication that spiritualism is alive in religion is when godly men 
seek demonic aid and guarantee God's protection for demon worship. Mm, mm, mm. I told you we had a lot to cover here and we have definitely covered a lot. I know there's more as Pastor John Loma King said, the Bible is a deep book, but we do have some time for closing thoughts. We'll start with Professor Perrin. That's right. Uh, you ever wondered why there are so many crazy ideas associated with communicating with the dead? It's because they had to make it all up themselves. You don't find it in God's word. And the truth always comes out. A lie will not last forever. So let's we take one more statement from the Old Testament about death. Isaiah 25 verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. Amen. 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 You know, the truth is liberating. You're, you, knowing this truth will liberate you from the fear of ghosts or even people that will try to deceive you by contacting the dead. You know, you're safer going through uh, a, a graveyard than being, walking through the streets of New York, Chicago, Miami, or Los Angeles. You can walk there. This is one of the safest places on earth being in a graveyard. So, John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You're now free from that fear. Amen. Amen. As we look at spiritualism in the last days, um, I just want to encourage you because you might be saying, oh, what if I'm going to be deceived and I want to be careful I'm not deceived. Study the Word of God. Open up His Word. See what He tells you and you have that assurance that you won't be deceived. And you know, friends, the devil has gone to the nth degree today. He has given you movies instead of God's word. He says, look at that movie and then you'll believe that that's what Noah and the ark is all about. Look at that movie and then you'll believe that's what the Ten Commandments is about. Look at that movie. Hey, I went to heaven and came back. I went to heaven many, many times. Look at that movie and you'll believe that's what happens with the dead. Don't rely on sensationalism and movie screens to communicate what God's Word makes very, very clear. I like that, Daniel. You said the reason why there's so much confusion, they have to make it up themselves. God's Word is not a make-believe book. It's solid. And that's why Psalms 91 verse 4, you want to be, you want to be shielded from, from deception? His truth shall be your shield and your defense. God's Word. Absolutely. Praise God. And that's exactly what the Bible is teaching us as we look there in Revelation chapter 16. Gathering means to entertain. And as Pastor John said, people are being entertained into spiritualism mm -hmm. by those frogs. This is a powerful, powerful truth that we need to be ready for because we have in our next lesson an impending conflict, an impending conflict that is coming to mesmerize our senses, as Joe was sharing. And we need to be able to step into the Word of God and stand in the Word of God because, as we've learned, it's departure from the Word of God that sets us up for deception. We're so glad you've joined us. Continue to join us and we look forward to our next study very soon.